DigitalJamSessions.com Hello and welcome to this Digital Jam special. Today we're joined once again by our VR Writers Room and in the mix today we have Andy Ewington, Charlie Dem McDermott, uh, Jeff Gomez, Kathleen Wallace and Rihanna Pratchett. Welcome once again guys to this Digital Jam special VR Writers Room edition. Uh, if you would like to remind our audience, our listeners, who you are and what you do, I'm going to start with you, Andy. Hello, I'm Andy Ewington, a comic writer um, that writes a lot of comics for the likes of 451 Media Group. Okay, and uh, has recently just sold out on your new latest comic, I might add. Thank uh, you. <laughs> and, uh, and Charlie, why don't you tell us more about what you do with Generation of Z? Kia ora koutou. Uh, hello, my name is Charlie McDermott. I am a creative entrepreneur and one of the creators of The Generation of Z, which is an immersive theatre show. I also work across uh, virtual reality and augmented reality uh, through other entertainment spheres. Wonderful. And Kathleen, why don't you tell us more about what you do? Sure, I'm Kathleen Wallace. I am a multi-hyphenate, like many people on this call. I am a writer, actor, producer, and creator of uh, theater pieces, as well as uh, web and mobile pieces. Wonderful, thank you. And Jeff, why don't you tell us all about Starlight Runner? Hey, I'm Jeff Gomez. I'm the chief executive officer of Starlight Runner. Uh, we're a New York-based production company that specializes in the development and uh, creation of content that leverages uh, all kinds of different media platforms in concert. I work on uh, projects as diverse as uh, uh, Pirates of the Caribbean and Transformers and Halo, but also on uh, uh, socio-political projects uh, using uh, education technology and things like that. We, we specialize also in understanding the way the technology works so that we can uh, orchestrate these projects across different media. Wonderful. Thank you, Jeff. So, Rihanna, why don't you tell us a little bit more about you and your illustrious career, which I believe pinnacled most recently with your Writers Guild Award. Um, yes, that was very exciting. Uh, so we just won the, the Writers Guild um, Award in LA for Vice Tomb Raider, um, and that was, that was really, truly wonderful. Um, and then we went down to DICE and picked up the Outstanding Achievement in Character Award for um, our work on Laura Croft, which was you know, equally amazing, especially as the DICE Awards are sort of industry people um, voting for industry people. So that was, uh, yeah, it was, it was a great trip. Um, so I'm, my name is Rihanna Pratchett. I'm a writer. Initially, uh, most of my work has been in video games, but I've branched out to sort of film and TV and comics, and I've worked on, um, you know, licenses like, like Tomb Raider, um, Mirror's Edge, Heavenly Sword, all the Overlord games. I've worked for um, DC and Dark Horse in the comics sphere, and sort of have multiple multiple projects on in, in film and TV at the moment. Wonderful. We're also joined by Kevin Williams. Kevin, why don't you tell us more about what you do? Well, I'm uh, lucky enough to be in the uh, out-of-home entertainment sector, uh, which specializes in the, the public space utilization of technology. We call it immersive technology. We don't specialize in any one particular field, mixed reality some people are using. We focus on people that are developing technology to go into theme parks and entertainment facilities, as well as the uh, uh, explosion in the uh, application of uh, entertainment or gamification in public space uh, utilization. I'm an ex Walt Disney Imagineer by training, but I run a consultancy, uh, publish the Stinger Report, the scurrilous news service, and uh, I'm also the founding chairman of the uh, Digital Out of Home Network Association. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for joining us on this VR Writers Room session. Uh, I am Tanya, the founder of Digital Jam, and your friendly host for this session. So, today's topic is all around the technology and techniques that we believe will be the way forwards with writing for VR. Now, I know that Jeff started in on this on one of the previous sessions, so I'm going to give you the floor, Jeff, as we can con continue that conversation around concurrent writing for multiple narrative stories utilizing the existing software or not using the uh, existing software depending on on your point of view <clears throat> okay well um 
uh, one of the uh, the most fascinating aspects of uh, of a, a virtual oh, reality, an immersive uh, virtual reality experience, is that you can um, uh, utilize something that we are all, as people who use the internet and use social media, something we're all getting used to, which is nonlinearity. Um, in other words, uh, when, when you enter into uh, a virtual environment, if the environment is, is going to ultimately be more than the uh, location in which you are standing, if this is a world uh, where, where things are going on that you can impact, well, then if you impact something that's right in front of you, it has uh, the possibility that it can impact things that are going on off screen. In other words, in places, parts of this world that you can't see. It's as simple as going into uh, a mansion in this virtual environment uh, and talking to someone and that person leaves the room, um, but that person can go in and essentially be programmed to uh, uh, speak to somebody else in the mansion which could I impact your future in that mansion as the plot unfolds. That takes a very special kind of technology, um, uh, and it takes a special kind of scripting. The closest we um, uh, have gotten, I think, to that kind of um, aesthetic and technological approach are in things like these sandbox video games, like Grand Theft Auto, mm. where... Um, you are moving around in a in a video game environment, doing things that uh, can ultimately come back, back to haunt you in in some way. Uh, there's a cause and effect to what it is that you're doing as the narrative unfolds. Um, so there is an established kind of technology and a kind of writing uh, uh, for that. Um, but it's going to be uh, amplified, I think, and, and new ways of, of developing um, our writing process and our production process are going to be necessary for these virtual worlds. Thank you. So, Kathleen, I know that you have a, a point of view about how this might look from a writer's perspective. And if, if I recall rightly, I also saw a lovely diagram of some sort. Would you care to explain and expand upon your theory? Sure. Uh, we'll see uh, how clear I can make it without visuals. So I was thinking about how I was thinking about how on a stage when we write for stage, we have the proscenium, and you can see the entire playing space at one time. And in virtual reality, the entire playing space is available to be seen, but is not necessarily. But but the audience doesn't see the entire space all the time, unlike theater. Mm. So the so I started thinking about how to write for this and how I would have everything seen at all the t at all times. So I created this document that is uh, four quadrants, and just for lack of a better term, I called it a west, north, east, and south because we we read left to right. So I I thought okay, well we start with left if we're facing north we start left with with right and work our way around and that's across the uh, x-axis and then across the y-axis there is uh, the uh, second point so 115 30 45 so that each page would be one minute of the script and then you could have it, it basically a chart of what's happening at all times with uh, at, at every moment in each quadrant so there, uh, that, uh, I would write the script as I would want the audience to see it so that I know for myself what the most important points are. And yes, uh, I, I made this point to the writer's room before, but uh, last week we talked how, about how important the uh, Bible is the, uh, for your world. So yes, of course, that comes first. And then um, I would write the story so that I, for myself, knew what was important and knew what I needed the audience to know to advance the plot, mm. to advance the story, and then I would fill in the rest. Okay. That's so, all clear. yes, I, 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 I take your point in terms of having that understanding in terms of spatially uh, being aware. 
and mm-hmm. also from the pers- perspective of wanting the audience to or, or knowing what you want the audience to experience mm-hmm. I'm curious from your perspective, Rihanna, because you have a lot of experience from a, a games narrative ex- uh, approach. Um, is there a similarity here? Are you seeing any similarity in the way that you would construct your narrative design or, or do you have a different approach to that? Um, well, I think actually there's a lot that theatre can teach um, game storytelling. Like, I think we, we tend to look towards Hollywood quite a lot because it's seen as kind of shiny and, and kind of the pinnacle of storytelling. And I don't actually think that's the case. I think particularly at the moment, um, TV has a power and diversity like it's never had before, worldwide TV. Mm. Um, there, there is actually a lot in common with um, yeah, the, the gaming space and, and the theatrical space as well. And there, there is quite a lot going on um, in the industry f- creating systemic narratives. So therefore, a narrative that... Uh, you know, it shapes and changes around what the player does in the game. So um, you might see systemic uh, systems at work in some like a civilization game where you know, you're playing through your campaign and then the other AI uh, controlled leaders are, are doing their own things and fighting each other and making deals. And that's never really been done that much in, in narrative. So the idea is to make narrative work like a, you know other systems do in games. And that's obviously very hard to do because you have a lot less control over kind of scenes and you have to sort of restructure things differently. But there's, there's a lot going on in that space at the moment. I think that's really interesting. Um, there, there's something sort of low level working uh, on that in Shadow of Mordor actually, which I've been playing recently. And that mm. Uh, has I can't remember if I mentioned it before, but uh, you you're kind of playing playing through as sort of one of conjoined characters, and you're fighting these orc-like creatures who are called Uryx. And every time you kill one, or they kill you, the game remembers, and your death is part of the game's narrative. So it's not a case of you just die and you and you come back on a save game. You've died, and the world has remembered. Like the the, the Uruk that kills you knows that they've killed you and will haunt you and they kill you again. They're not in power mm. and they'll fight other little ricks. And and they'll so every time you sort of complete a little mission, there's a there's um a screen for the Ulrich and it's almost like a chessboard and they'll kind of move round and defeat one another and grow in power. And they'll grow in power if you don't defeat them either. If they beat you and you don't beat them, they'll grow in power, they'll be harder to take down next next time and you know they'll they remember how you how they killed you and they'll remember if you left them with a scar before you died and now they'll kind of it's a very clever way of um pulling you into the world and making you feel like your actions are are having an impact on that world Mm. and it's interesting because a lot of what you're talking about there really does require a certain degree of artificial intelligence to kind of remember and and learn as it's going in some ways in terms of what you as the you know the audience have done to impact the environment and I know that Charlie you have some thoughts on this in terms of um, the kind of development of software and the development of artificial intelligence for the purposes of writing for VR so I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on this yeah I think um, just to t- sort of give some context what, the way that we wrote the Generation of Z, which has four simultaneous storylines and choices in each room where we split the audience into four and they are interconnected by video uplinks so they can see each other, but then we use camera trickery within that to make them believe you know, you know there's 200 zombies outside when really there are four people banging on a wall. Um, the, 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 the way we scripted that was to write all the scenes simultaneous. We direct and we play all the scenes, uh, and we rehearse them all up in, in, in their, in their, on their own. And then we put them all together through timings. Now there are choices in each of the rooms that affect the overall narrative. So there is about 18 different ways you can see the show. Some choices are just A or B options. Do I kill this pregnant woman who's having a miscarriage in my room or not? Uh, 
some of them have three options. So the actors and the skill and the technique of the actor is uh, they, they know all three options that the audience will choose and they uh, take it upon themselves to then, you know, play the scene out with the three different endings uh, or, sorry, the three different options in that room, mm-hmm. which then affect the overall ending. Um, we did have people come sort of 20 odd times to try and make and affect every change within each room to sort of see. But that is a very uh, old school, rudimental, you know, you can't really have more than that going on in an actor's mind than three options. So the only way forward is for there to be a technology or, like you said, a piece of AI, even though there's no such thing as AI, it's just complex algorithms, but you know what I mean, <laughs> um, and, and act like a, a game master in Dungeons & Dragons. And I think this has come up before, where the, the, the beauty of, a, of, of the game master is that they have, they are, they have a human side to their to them who is over who is looking over the characters and looking over the story as a whole so it's not just the technical side of i need to give you the rules and the structure but there is a a human emotional side where they are uh you know feeding in and and providing a a platform for the story that's unique and in this moment and only right now to happen um so so the development of any technology in my mind will need and any ai in quotation marks will really need to uh, understand the human side of that um i I mean to me you know in a theme park or or, you know obviously I'm, i'm working doing some stuff with the x team x lab for ilm and we're looking at the star wars new new theme park and all of that as well as what what they can do in terms of their VR and, and AR storytelling, uh, they they want it to be more immersive. They want it to have a story, uh, but no one really knows right now what the technology is going to be to manage it all. Hmm. Um, and I think this is where the opportunity lies now. And, and my question out of today simply was, you know, we as writers now that the technology is almost ahead of us. Like in the '90s, it was so it was going to be the big thing, but it was just not good enough, and it went away. And now it's come back because, and now we're trying to catch up with techniques with the technology. Yeah. Um, we have a responsibility, I think, to to be involved with developing some of that te- technology. You know, another another issue is going on around, you know, um, where obviously I live in New Zealand, well, live between New Zealand and, and, and uh, um, the States. Weta have been developing Thunderbirds for, you know, two, three, four years. They've done a, done a deal with Magic Leap, but Ma- Magic Leap are off on their own doing their own technology, but they never the twain would meet because they didn't develop the technology with the IP universe, with the creativity at the same time. Yeah. And this continues to happen. And I think for us to bridge the gap, and this is kind of what I think XLab have been doing, uh, is to bring creatives, bring technologists together to solve these problems from the outset rather than all oh, these amazing technology over here and these amazing artists over here kind of working in isolation just guessing a little bit so i don't i don't have an answer but i just know that in my from for my two cents um something does need to come out of that those two groups it's interesting that you should uh, bring up um ilm and and kind of you know theme parks um given that we have kevin in the mix today um, Kevin, I'm very interested to hear from you then in, in terms of your experience with crafting narrative storytelling for these experiences, um, whether or not you have the technology already or whether you think that there is more development that needs to happen around this technology. Well, thank you very much. Um, I, I'd also thank you, Charlie, for a perfect segue <laughs> into uh, describing our sector. Fundamentally, the out-of-home entertainment sector is totally different to the consumer sector, and most of the people are focusing on the consumer application of virtual reality with all of the restrictions and problems that uh, that has. It's sort of like trying to talk about television before you even have the film industry, and uh, that is really a, a lot of the reasons for the stumbling. Let me give you some context. Uh, so I come from an amusement background, video arcade machines when they were big in the day, Uh, And then I got sucked into military simulation, where powerful computer systems were used to create immersive presence systems for training people how to drop nuclear devices on Russia. Uh, And then from that into the first fledgling attempts of virtual reality. Uh, And then I was headhunted by Walt Disney Imagineering to get involved with what they felt was Uh, the need to understand the tools and the opportunity that the technology of immersion and immersive digital uh, entertainment offered to their audience mix. Uh, And that really was following on from the success of Star Tours, 
which took a military simulator, fl uh, military flight simulator system, and turned it into an entertainment piece. We created Disney Quest, which holds the record for the longest uh, immersive entertainment facility still in operation, with the longest running uh, virtual reality attraction, um, Aladdin's Magic Carpet Ride, which is still running to this day and will mm -hmm. only be closing. Sadly, in uh, uh, Jan uh, June, I've been told now, it's moved the dates again. So you understand that I feel that a lot of the tools are here, and we've already had them. That's why I don't try and use the word virtual reality all the time, but I mm -hmm. like to talk about immersion and presence. Uh, and also, I'm very concerned that some of the lessons that we learned from the Aladdin's uh, application back in the 90s, as well as the virtual reality entertainment systems, from the late 90s may have gone missing purely because there is a concern in the virtual reality community that if you talk about previous applications there is a danger that you will uh, talk about the elephant in the room which is patent ownership mm. uh, and uh, there's a lot of issues which uh, I've come across recently now working on projects that are using virtual reality in public space where there are certain issues that need to be uh, bore in mind on how you apply this, uh, the narrative as well as the technology. Mm. So in your opinion do you feel that we already have the creative writing tools for engineering these experiences that that already exists or, or do you feel it is something that needs further development in as much as when we when we look to the the atypical listener of uh, you know a series like this it's going to be somebody who is writing for one of the entertainment verticals be that film game comics theater immersive theater whatever it may be thinking about how they can shift and pivot their skill set into something like uh, you know virtual reality immersive experiences whatever we want to call it but to apply those skill sets into this new genre that they may not be entirely familiar with. Now, for many people, they might just go to you know a very traditional piece of software and say, I can write a script, that's great. It's gonna give me a walkthrough on how I should do this. And once I've got the hang of that, I can just you know crack on and write a script and, and create a story, create narrative. Yeah. But, but in the context of these types of experiences, do you feel that something like that does currently exist or do you think it's something that needs to be developed? All, uh, all applications of narrative need to be developed, uh, that, that is a given. Mm -hmm. But there's also the, uh, the other issue, which is I don't believe that all of the uh, applications of narrative in part, uh, imparting have been achieved with film. A couple of years ago, everybody would have told me that they've seen it all and done it all, and then along came Cloverfield, and that pointed us in a different direction. So this is a constantly iterative uh, art form, mm -hmm. and it's a pleasure to be able to say that none of us know what the future holds. Regarding the technology applications, we have moved more towards agency than we have to virtual reality. And this is an incredibly hard thing for a lot of, of the screenwriters that I come across and uh, the film and television individuals that want to break into my side of VR, being able to entertain large audiences with an entertainment narrative where they leave impacted, mm -hmm. uh, is that we have the tools. There is a, a, a student right now sitting in a Midwest or even a Chinese uh, uh, educational facility that will apply his tools, her tools, to the application of immersive entertainment and bring a brand new genre. None of us can uh, signpost how we're going to get there, but we do know that we are going to get there because this technology, thankfully, is moving forward again. The issues I have is agency. Okay, and do you want to give some context around agency? So, interactivity in the film industry has always been very, very, very difficult. Mm. Uh, mainly because you know, I'm a great fan of uh, traditional Shakespeare played at the Globe Theatre in the open air to the audience and agency has existed since then the ability for the audience to heckle and cajole the actors and for them to be strong enough in their portrayal to come back in character with a good uh, a good retition to uh, the, the heckling that is a linear path with the ability for uh, some agency and that seems to be the problem that we're looking at with virtual reality now the problems that the consumer virtual reality applications have over the 
what I would call the out-of-home entertainment virtual reality systems, will differ. But the same way that Circle Vision succeeded in the theme park sector but has never made it to the consumer sector shows that there is some gulf between technologies. Okay. And Jeff, what would be your take on that from, from a consumer VR perspective? Do you feel that there is an issue with agency? Uh, well, of course, and and um, and that is going to be um, uh, the purview of uh, uh, the technological development capabilities of the producers. Um, uh, one of the um, uh, fantasies that I have about uh, virtual reality um, dates back to uh, a novel written in 1981 uh, called Dream Park by Larry Niven and uh, Stephen Barnes. Uh, it's set in a, uh, a futuristic amusement park where um, uh, characters would role play in virtual environments, um, but the, um, uh, the technology wasn't quite there to, to conduct the narrative um, uh, by itself, giving um, the uh, players or participants agency enough to completely move through an automated uh, narrative. You actually had to have a, a, a kind of storyteller, a referee, a dungeon master of sorts, who was uh, manipulating the environment around uh, these characters um, and, uh, and fabricating and, and role-playing into uh, these figures uh, to... Um, uh, to respond uh, automatically to the complete agency of the uh, of the characters, um, who knows? Maybe there will be a, a something like that as an intermediary between now and and when uh, virtual worlds can be uh, fully automated. Okay, and Andy, from your perspective, I know that you were interested in this idea and this notion of software perhaps being able to meta tag, you know, the characters as you move forward, so that. From a writer's perspective, it's incredibly easy to be able to sift through that volume of data that, that comes inherently with the types of universes that Jeff is talking about uh, and the complexity that's been discussed in terms of narrative and, and concurrent narrative. So do you, do you feel that this is something that, that can be uh, you know, easily crafted? Um, I wouldn't know if it could be easily crafted. Um, I, I'm not a programmer, but certainly um, as an end user, um, I I think it's something that will shift and, and move towards. Um, I'm 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 really picking up on Kathleen's little diagram that she sent around, which um, I'm sure you'll sort of share after the show. But um, that that seemed to make um, a bit of sense. That sort of north, south, east, west um, divide and writing into. Uh, a 3D sphere. Um, I think I think meta tagging will be part of that, so that it helps the writer actually see how the the spread of the narrative is going, um, and it's almost like those mind nodes that you get where you can actually see um, and, and a bit of AI thinking where you can see consequences uh, once you start writing in and moving uh, certain meta tags around. Um, you can see how that will give you this sort of butterfly effect. Mm. Uh, and picking up on the dungeon master, I'm actually, I'm actually thinking a lot that um, the the narrative is actually starting to move a little bit potentially towards the fighting fantasy universe. Those sort of choose your own adventure books. Mm. Um, I, I can certainly see a program that writes with that, with a little bit of, little bit of borrowing from little bits of of, of Kathleen's idea of this sort of three D sphere. But with the audience potentially moving as well, I, I think, I think that something like that needs to be developed. Um, I don't think we're too far away once um, sort of technology slightly catches up, because um, you know things like Final Draft already do that for the for the uh, movie industry, where it starts to already um, preempt um, sort of characters and scenes. Um, I think it will develop. I think I think you'll probably see people like Final Draft or, or uh, Scriber sort of pushing. The boundary into to sort of accept and, and develop uh, VR scripting. Hmm. Okay, I, I'm curious to understand because I know that, for example, um, Samsung have just announced the new Gear 360 um, camera system, 
and you know various other uh, manufacturers have their that you know the Nokia Ozo and, and various other cameras going to make it into the general population in certainly the next kind of six to eight months and I'm curious because a lot of what we're talking about here is very much you know what we might classify as true VR I'm using inverted commas here um, but on the other flip end of that there is this whole kind of 360 VR aspect that hasn't necessarily been explored in great depth in these groups and I'm, I'm curious from perhaps your perspective Charlie because I think you you probably have a take on this um, in terms of that idea that people will want to experiment with these cameras and kind of get in there and do a bit of guerrilla filmmaking and try to, to shoot things in 360 from a live action perspective suddenly this 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 is very much limiting the rules from a game environment perspective when we create what we might call true vr there is this element of control we have control over movement in this universe and with 360 film obviously there is some limitation in that and i'm curious from your perspective how you see the development of 360 film evolving as a medium alongside true vr yeah, I think um, for me, it's always been quite clear, which is uh, I make a full scale, immersive, interactive theater piece where I've broken the fourth wall and I've brought my audience through and the audience are a character in the show. We cannot forget that. But for a 360 VR, if I was going to uh, film that is I would place a 360 camera where the audience is. Mm -hmm. um, and that everything still happens. It, we rehearse the whole show, and then you're almost shooting the film in one shot, almost. Now, there are techniques you can use to wipe and to transition, mm -hmm. but that, to me, um, is, is technically how you would do it, which would mean there is no more grip. There's no, I mean, there are grips, but there, there's no lighting. The lighting is all either existing or put in in post. Um, you can't have everyone's mics uh, through radio mics because, you, you know, you can see everything in a 360 environment. Mm. I just, um, last week, uh, I don't know how much I can talk about, but um, I have a little agency. So we've started doing these experiences, the virtual reality experiences for brands. Um, and uh, one of them is for quite a well-known winery where we took drones up with 360 cameras and we filmed early morning like a day in the life of a winery. Mm -hmm. We come right up to viticulturalists, we move into the vines, and then there's a bit of a story around that. So it's the, it's the first time we've looked at using transitions rather than shooting something in one go. Mm -hmm. So there are six different shots of which we have tried to take some 2D linear story techniques um, and 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 do it with the 360. We're currently in the edit, so I don't know what it's turning out like. I've seen I've seen the shots themselves, but I'm interested to see how the shots fit together in a nice cohesive uh, narrative way. Mm. Um, and again, though, that is just 360 technology. It's nothing super special. And and I do think that by the the prol proliferation of all of these consumer um, hardware products to where you can, like you said, get out in the background, the back, backyard and shoot something yourself, I think people are going to start to develop their own techniques and their own ways of doing that. Um, and I do think it's important that, that that is done before this idea of true VR. Yes, they're going to go alongside each other, but um, we do need to understand how, how 360 is going to change the face of filmmaking. Uh, albeit big or small, um, and then how that true VR will then fit within that. Um, okay. Yeah. So, Rihanna, I'm curious from your perspective, because I know that you've done a bit of writing for TV as well. Um, do you see this as, as something that is plausible as, as TV development? Because I know that a, a lot of people are going to look at this and kind of think, there's no way you could broadcast that. <laughs> not in, in a traditional TV sense. Um, but I'm curious from your perspective whether or not you think that that's doable from a creative narrative perspective because I think a lot of this 360 initially is going to be things like documentaries and gigs and you know sports events and stadiums you know something where somebody can just take their camera stick it in the middle of some action and let things happen around it but I'm very curious to understand from your perspective whether or not you think there is um, you know there's going to be an opportunity for 360 narrative um, style uh, footage as well. I mean, I, th I think so. I mean, the idea of sort of putting the, the camera where the audience is is, is is pretty much how sort of first-person shooters kind of work n now. Mm. And I, I think, um, or, or, you know, sorry, not just first-person shooters, but, but go to the first-person perspective. So 
um, you know, that that's uh, pretty interesting because, you know, even though you can sort of work with systemic storytelling and how the, the, the players' actions affect different segments of the world, you are still going to be able to control where, for example, if we're talking about it from a, a game perspective, you can always, you can know where the player is going to be at any one time in the world. So you can create a sort of smoke and mirrors effect that things are sort of changing in, in the sphere of the player and the, you know, they don't appear to have changed uh, until the player has, has kind of moved around the world. So you can sort of keep them in the narrative bubble mm. uh, and you know, it's, it's a kind of the systemic narrative really. So you're, you're sort of shaping the player, you're sort of keeping the player in this sort of narrative bubble uh, and you obviously you know where the player is in that world so you do have some control uh, because they're, you know, obviously they'll be moving around in that world in the same way they would sort of a any kind of uh, 3D environment. Um, and so that, that in alone has its potential for storytelling, and I'm very interested in uh, the applications for environmental storytelling, for example, because mm. and, and showing a player affecting the world by affecting the visuals of the world. For example, you know, a, a barren landscape, the player explores the world and does something and something they, they see that changing into a beautiful garden or something like that. They, you know, we it was really sort of the Half-Life games and then certainly moving on to the Bioshock games where environmental storytelling started to become um, very important in games and there was much more of a push for that. We've also got mobile games like um, uh, Spider, uh, the, the Manor, um, which was almost entirely done by uh, environmental storytelling, where you played a sort of a little spider character, and that actually I could see some really interesting applications of that in VR, where you're sort of you're playing the, the spider in VR and mm. you're kind of moving in a, in a, you know, a, a fully 360 realized world. Um, because in, in Spider, you were kind of because you were small, you were kind of getting into the nooks and crannies of this, this haunted house, and you were finding like secret boxes of stuff um, under the floor or you know, ancient letters and notes stuffed in cracks and you were sort of piecing the story together like that and I think that's those sort of things that are just environmental storytelling and a little bit of text you know, they're going to be very powerful in VR and the, the whole idea of the of perspective um, you know, and, and literally stepping into the shoes of the character is going to be very interesting you know, I, I, I think that the, the possibilities are Wide open at the moment. Um, obviously, we've only just dipped our toes in the water, so it's not. It's not. I'm not entirely sure what is going to be possible, but I think it feels like what games are doing at the moment is, especially with as I'm mentioning systemic narrative, that's going to be very relevant. Mm. Um, and I think what we're doing in shaping systemic narrative in games will will end up being, you know, equally powerful in VR, and probably that's where it's going to sort of transfer over next once we kind of get it properly working in games and we're still sort of yeah there's been a lot of experiments we, we still haven't got something something big fully out there that is mm, okay I, I think it, that there is a lot of um opportunity coming you know down the pipeline in terms of new new opportunities for people who were traditionally in a slightly different um role sector industry vertical whatever um, in as much as being able to transfer and shift some of those skills and those that that knowledge into VR, uh, and I say VR in the broader sense, you know whether that's immersive, you know uh, experiences or, or you know true VR. Um, and I'm I'm curious. And I'm opening this out to the floor, so whoever would like to respond. Um, but I'm I'm curious to understand from the perspective of the people in this group whether or not we think there is a particular skill set that is actually something of a shortage at the moment but that will only be enhanced more so by the explosion of vr and i, I say thing you know this in the, in the context of you know vfx uh, and the fact that actually we might be a bit short on some of that talent uh, but it's something that's really fundamental and crucial uh, moving forwards for filmmaking in vr for example could I in interject just quickly there about uh, one of the statements that was uh, made about having a narrator? Mm. Uh, we're actually seeing deployed in facilities that are operating right now the use in room scale or arena scale VR, someone that is a minder. It, it builds upon 
what we've seen in the theme park sector where you need uh, to have an attendant to uh, support the theme park ride you know the roller coaster can't move unless the uh, load master and the launch master agree and you know they launch and you're in their hands for safety the same thing we're seeing with projects like the void uh, and with zero latency and i can't go into too much detail but mm. they are using a individual who is narrating or helping the individual round, they're the, the god figure, the voice in the person's air, mm. but also they're the person that is helping. So we are seeing physical actors being deployed into the agency of interactive virtual reality experiences. It's interesting that you, that you bring this up because actually it's one of the, the pieces of research that came out of um, Dubbit uh, who, the, you know, they, they came up with, with a number of different findings but one of the findings was this, this idea and notion that um, there needs to be somebody or something that grounds the user, the audience in, in reality. So whether that is, you know, for a child, you know, a teddy bear that's always familiar to them, that's kind of helping to guide them through that journey and that, you know, bedtime story or, or whatever it may be, to whether or not that is a physical actor guiding you through that process as well. Um, and it's, it's interesting as well because in some of the experiences that, that are out there from a 360 film perspective, I, I noticed that, for example, somebody like Chris Milk, you know, when he does his, um, you know, his, his presentations and he normally has one of his experiences with him for people to, you know, slip on the, the, the Samsung, uh, you know, gear and be able to experience that. There is a certain degree of, of instruction that goes with that, you know, where he will say, oh, you need to stand up. You need to, you know, make sure your headphones are the right way around. And, and he will actually kind of semi guide you through the process if you're new to VR and you've never experienced it before. So I do think there is quite a lot of merit in this idea that, that actually there does need to be, um, you know, an element of guidance for the user. But I'm, I'm curious to understand, Jeff, from your perspective, whether or not you do think that there is going to be a potential skills gap that's coming up, you know, in the next five years or so, as a result of, you know, this transference of skills across different industry. Uh, in, in terms of, of the the, uh, the technical skills that it will take to put these things together, mm. it, it is going to be um, we're, we're going to to see a, a shortage for a while, I think, um, and that's because um, uh, when when um, when we moved uh, and jumped, uh, I was in the video game industry when we jumped uh, console generations a couple of times when we moved to the. Uh, for example, the, the Nintendo 64 platform or, or um, uh, uh, the Xbox and, and PlayStation um, uh, iterations uh, occurred. Um, uh, at each of those junctures, there were shortages of people who had the, uh, the, the technological capability to, uh, to take full advantage of the new features there. And, um, and so we, we ran into a, a shortfall of talent. Um, in the case of uh, of VR, um, that, this is a whole new medium. So, so uh, I'm glad to see so many people playing with the kits uh, that are available now and and um, uh, available uh, freely all around the world. I might add, I, I'm encountering these everywhere I go, mm. on the planet. Um, but at the same time, um, w once we're getting ready to to uh, to really uh, create polished uh, presentations, even simple ones. Um, that that skill set is going to be relatively rarefied. So, um, hopefully, if the direction of the of the industry looks um, as as kind of upbeat as people seem to be feeling right now, um, that's a call for for people to uh, to move into these uh, areas of specialty. So I, I, I would throw this curveball at you then, which is that from a technical perspective, I think we acknowledge and accept that there is going to be a potential skill gap. But I'm very interested to understand from a writing and from a creator's perspective, so that, that creative skill set, um, whether or not we think that there, there is going to be enough education for this new medium going forwards because I'm very aware that, that actually there are a lot of people who will move across from different sectors whether it's game whether it's theatre whether it's comic whether it's you know film who will try to move into VR or immersive experience writing and actually there are quite a lot of differences 
between all of these industries and sectors when it comes to how to successfully execute narrative for an immersive experience. And I think Kevin would probably agree with that. And so I'm, I'm curious to understand whether we think that there is going to be a, a sudden need for further education in this specific niche, in this specific area, um, and whether or not we think that perhaps, you know, there is going to be a bit of a, a gap in the meantime. Kevin? Well, we, you know, as one of those people that started off, you know, looking at vector graphics with asteroids and lunar lander, and uh, had to suffer the transition to 8-bit graphics and then to <laughs> vector graphics and then to polygons and then to texture mapping. Uh, you know, A, as a developer, I became farther and farther away from the creation process and more involved with the development process. Mm. Um, and we are at a very interesting point, and I'm, I am by nature a very confrontational and uh, problematic individual, and I, I am going to stick my ego into the <laughs> fire and say that we're due for a shake-up in the consumer games sector. Okay. Uh, we were very lucky that the failure of 3D TV and 3D interactive gaming didn't pull down more companies, but if you are like myself, having to do the due diligence for investors of researching the wealth and operational qualities of certain of the large publishers as well as the large corporations, you can see that there's quite a, a large hole. So my gut, and of course it is very big and full of alcohol, but uh, hopefully uh, it is accurate uh, or else I wouldn't be a consultant. The, the gut is telling me that we're going to see a shake-up no matter how successful virtual reality is. Mm. We're going to see a limitation on the number of AAA titles that are being developed. Not everybody in the AAA universe can transfer across to virtual reality. They're going to have to find jobs in other forms of interactive. And we may see the piggyback. So when we saw 3D, uh, sorry, uh, Polygon uh, and uh, what we call 3D rendered graphics being popular in the console sector, that also fired the artistic side, the development tool side, and that also led indirectly to the mobile game application sector. So for every uh, cloud there is a silver lining. Now, how many of the people currently used can be utilized in the virtual reality revolution? Unknown. If I knew that I'd be sitting on a beach earning 20%. <laughs> the argument is how many of them want to? Mm. Could we see an explosion of independence? There are, well, I'll use Disney as a perfect example. A lot of us Imagineers, after the failure of virtual reality to penetrate as much as we thought it was going to, and location-based entertainment, a lot of us left Imagineering to go off and do other jobs. And poor old Imagineering uh, has had to go through the process of hunting down new blood, and, you know, all of us old Imagineers that worked on the virtual reality projects get these weird emails every couple of months saying, Oi, would it be nice of you to just pop in and see our new boys <laughs> and, give, and give them the benefit of your experience, which is, in other words, free consultancy. We may feed you some cookies. The same is true with uh, uh, ILM. A lot of the individuals that were involved with the virtual reality cave co-projects before uh, Star Wars was hot again before virtual reality was hot again, have left, moved on. Many of them taught. Sadly, uh, the talents of people like Randy Pausch are now no longer available to us. Uh, individuals that led the charge of uh, the development of virtual reality. So I think there's going to be a sprinkling of the old, but I think it's going to be in the new hands of the developer. Okay. And I'm curious to understand from your perspective, Andy, obviously a lot of the, the, the kind of comic industry, so to speak, tends to be a bit multifaceted as it is because I think there, there is a kind of a, a lot of skill sets that can be transferred across to other things. So I think we, we tend to find that there are a lot of people do wear multiple hats in the comic industry. I'm curious from your perspective whether or not you see that as being something that that people will want to try and resource themselves into this VR industry? Yeah, I think so. I think it's um, uh, writers in general tend to be always wanting to write, no matter what the medium is. And, um, you know, if you look at um, Rihanna as a perfect example and how she's sort of diversified into different sectors, um, and myself, I'm whenever I write now, I tend to write 
even though it's in comic form, I write it as 60 pages so that it's immediately available as a pilot. Mm. Um, I think you'll find that writers will naturally gravitate um, if they see an uptake. Um, and they'll have their, their finger on the pulse of, of what's happening within the industry. And if they see other people starting to sort of move into that sector, they'll think, um, yeah, maybe it's something I should look into. Um, and they're quite a resourceful bunch, and they will, they will start to, um, <laughs> like anything, um, people, people do it for money as much as love. So um, as long as writers are continually paid uh, a good wage and, and can sort of keep the walls from the doors, um, then um, I, I would imagine that um, it's some, certainly something that they would look to do, something I would do mm. uh, if I knew that, one, artistically, I could get something um, very cool out of it, uh, and two, um, certainly it, it meant that bills got paid at the end of the month. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm curious because something has just come to mind um, that I, I think is interesting to put to this group, actually. Um, and that was a conversation that I had with a young man by the name of Benji earlier on today who has a fascinating um, theory when it comes to licensing and rights um, and and the use of blockchain. And I don't know if anybody has read his, his uh, article or not, um, but he, he he's proposing a, a new infrastructure to allow the recording of licensing and, and uh, ownership for content within the blockchain and specifically applying that to the music industry, but also the VR industry. And so it brings me to this natural question, which is, as writers, obviously you, you write your script and then it's very specifically for a particular thing, uh, unless it's treatment, in which case, you know, it could be just about anything. But, um, you know, you, you write a, you know, a piece of content with an ideal of where you think it's going to end up. But when we talk about this multitude of different platforms, this multitude of, of the kind of evolution of digital technology and where your, your piece could end up, um, and I'm curious to hear thoughts on, on whether or not we think that there is danger that with new and emerging technologies like VR, that there isn't enough thought being given to rights and licensing and how these things are going to be divvied up in the future. Um, and I, I'm quite curious to hear your thoughts on, on, on this, uh, Jeff. <laughs> it's um, uh, something we have to think about all the time. Um, it, it's um, it's one of the most difficult aspects of, uh, of for example, transmedia storytelling, where um, there are so many uh, factions involved that if, uh, if, if we're um, uh, coming to enhance a, an immersive experience, which is something that's uh, happened with us uh, a lot lately, where there is a... Um, uh, an actual environment, and they want uh, the guest to have an environmental experience, and they have some rudimentary narrative, but they're asking us to come in and um, and and enhance that narrative and and make it uh, capable of leveraging the technology at hand. And we go, well, um, okay, we we we'd love to do that, but you know, we have to make up a whole lot more. Than, than what you've made up. So, so we'd like to, to take some equity in the intellectual property that emerges from that. And they look at us as if we have three heads. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they, they, um, uh, they say, well, no, the, the intellectual property's here. Um, uh, you know, all you're doing is, is helping it out. And, and we said, well, the, this is very elaborate. And you want this to be able to function across different media platforms and perhaps spin out as a feature film or comic book series, that takes a lot of work. That mm. takes a, a lot of invention. Um, and especially because you want it so rich and immersive, we have to run all of these analyses on the kinds of technologies that you're using to make this work. Um, I, I think uh, we're going to see a lot of that in, um, in virtual reality, which is uh, uh, going to require some... Um, uh, fairly innovative legal models uh, mm -hmm. that we can um, uh, get these uh, negotiations done in in less than a year, which is sometimes <laughs> what it takes Starlight Runner to, to, to do a negotiation. Mm. And negotiation is also one of those things that, that does tend to be a little bit out of the, uh, the skip of experience for the smaller indies who might want to get into the low end of this market. Absolutely. But 
what I will say is this, is that you should all know better by now, which is if you type something in Skype, I will call you out on it. So Kathleen, feel free to share. <laughs> yeah, no, I just, uh, I, I wanted to hear what Jeff said, but I also, as soon as you were talking about the ownership and the rights, I, I was thinking about YouTube because it's a huge problem on YouTube. And in January, there is an announcement from YouTube and GoPro that they are going to work together on 3D and 360 degree video. And particularly because they're very interested, they think that this particular kind of technology, this particular kind of video is going to do very well on mobile. Mm. And you, they're, they're even working already on, if I remember correctly, uh, from the news, there are, YouTube is already working on uh, fitting out their YouTube spaces, which are spaces that they uh, give free use to uh, creators who have over a certain amount of followers get to use these spaces for free. And they're already fitting out those spaces for 3D and 360 content. So this is, it, it, you know, protect everything, people. Protect everything. <laughs> <laughs> But Kevin, um, I, I see you're also busy typing away as well. Um, but that that, that is a, a valid question. Sorry, I'm responding directly to Kevin's uh, question in Skype, which is, who owns your stuff? Well, <laughs> it, it, we, we've got a we've got a serious problem. Uh, I deal in the experiential industry, mm. and we are sadly the the guys in suits. We have taken an entertainment narrative and been able to monetize it. Um, the reason why most of the successful films you see are going to have theme parks uh, or, or areas of theme parks dedicated to them is because of the hand-in-glove relationship between IP brand franchise and the um, what we would call the theatrical entertainment facility business. Now, we have to deal with the elephant in the room, which is fundamentally the VR community which we are now living in, started off as a bunch of VR community guys, uh, which were euphemistically called by some the hippies and the, the, the hipsters and the trendies, who wanted a love-in, open-source, everybody-enjoys-everybody's-work kind of environment for VR. I know so many people like that. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> and sadly, um, you know, I, I'm all, I always have a problem when I go. Uh, I used to go to these meetings back in 2012. I would go to these VR startup meetings, mm -hmm. and there'd be this guy called Palmer Lucky and Nate and all of these others, and they're all definitely not business guys. And there were no business individuals there, and I was the only one in the suit, and I was kind of pushed in the corner and left to the bar. Now, obviously, jumping in bed with Facebook. Now, working out the realities of what Google uh, and what Apple are thinking about doing with this technology, a lot of people have worked out that all of the problems that they were seeing with YouTube, yeah. where YouTube suddenly thinks that it owns everything and keeps your money, that's going to happen in VR. And a lot of people have stopped drinking the Kool-Aid and become very, very angry. And I wouldn't recommend this for anyone, but if you go onto Reddit and you try and put any comment that doesn't follow the line, you're going to get flamed. And the thing that I'm seeing a lot is I, I get to walk around with my I told you so t-shirt on because I've seen this before when <laughs> VR went through the uh, VPL period, which we would call phase three, or when it went through the uh, virtuality period, which we would call phase three. And I call this, you know, I keep on saying this to Palmer, I keep on saying it to other individuals, oh, very enjoyable, we're at phase four. Mm. And, you know, he goes, no, no, this is it, this is unique, this is, you know, you can't say that. Well, now we're seeing that big business can kill good ideas. And as I typed at the bottom, own your stuff, people. <laughs> own your stuff. Because the media would like you not to own your stuff. They would like you to download films but not own a physical copy. They are literally trying, and I don't, I don't mean to sound like a tin foil head or a, you know, a conspiracy nut. It's just that's how monetization seems to be working at the moment for entertainment medium. Mm. And, and we in the out-of-home experience, we're selling experiences, the most uh, difficult gossamer to keep. The only thing we can do is take a video of you walking through our experience for you to be able to have a, some kind of takeaway. Until we can record your brain activity, we don't have any way to capture it. So we're trying to offer experiential, mm. where the physical entertainment media sector is trying to monetize to create the walled garden. Mm. So blockchain, Benji's concept, do you think it has any, any, any sales, any wind in those sales? Uh, it would be, 
I've seen about four or five uh, since we saw at the beginning of the year the YouTube uh, and Facebook situation where they're now talk and, and of course uh, pick entrance and uh, uh, the image profile company saying that they now own the content that you put onto their sites. I'm seeing a lot of people now proposing, uh, shall we say, a happy clappy approach to uh, content ownership. Sadly, I don't think it will fly, but if I knew everything, I'd be nailed to a cross right now. <laughs> but Andy has also typed something quite interesting into the Skype. I don't know why we suddenly resorted to using the Skype chat, but... Um... Uh, Andy makes a very good point, which is his manager probably wouldn't let him take on a VR job without, first of all, knowing that all of this legal stuff has been sorted out. And I'm, I'm curious from your perspective, Andy, does this mean that you would not want to work on VR in the meantime? Because that is quite an interesting question, you know, an interesting problem. If professional writers of a particular calibre, i.e. those who have management, um, wouldn't be in a legal situation to necessarily yeah. work on content like this does this mean that we're going to be kind of burdened with you know less experienced less talented folks who maybe don't have representation kind of you know getting in there just wanting to get their hands dirty with it but that does mean that as a result they're not owning the content what what do you think is the potential here um i, I from from my point of view um i wouldn't say less talented but i just i just think there will be a certain um level of of writer that won't touch it um, until they they are comfortable knowing who owns what, um, the the ramifications and fallout of of not owning your own stuff when you think you do um, is, is huge. Mm. Um, and certainly, um, I wouldn't um, look to to touch VR until I was absolutely comfortable that my management uh, team had said, "Yeah, you can do it now." Mm. Uh, but I don't think it it should stop people from 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 trying and going into it, um, but go in with that sort of, look, try not to put your best idea into it because you may not come out of it owning it unless you've actually sort of checked everything. Hmm. Rihanna, what's your take on that? When it comes to games, uh, writers don't tend to own anything anyway. So, and that, that goes for, for all levels of games, writers. So, so we are quite used to not having um, the, the kind of intellectual rights that, that other uh writers have in other mediums, so we don't tend to get you know, you know, back ends or, or percentage of production budgets or, or things like that. Um, as, as more writers get management, um, get, game writers I'm talking about specifically, then there, there are some things changing to bring writers a little bit more in line with writers in other entertainment mediums, um, but still we're, we're kind of a way off, like there's, there's Unless you're talking indies, there's, there's really no such thing as, as kind of royalties for, for game writers. Uh, obviously, if you're working with a smaller team, you can negotiate for percentage of sales or um, bonus on sales. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's really down to the kind of individuals in the project. So there's no... Uh, I would kind of be used to that as, as a game writer um, because that's kind of the way it is at the moment. So I, I wouldn't really be too bothered about it uh, but you know obviously I'd want to, my, my management to you know <laughs> negotiate a good fee which is really what, what game writers have uh, at the moment that they, they you know have their flat fee and that's pretty much it but um, yeah I mean it, it's going to be an interesting problem for potentially getting writers in from other mediums um, to work on it so I don't know whether that will that'll mean what the It'll be easier for game writers to kind of psychologically uh, transfer. To, to <laughs> They're kind of used to the way that works. Yeah. But on the other hand, you could say, well, you know, the way that that works is is maybe uh, not great in the games industry at the moment. Like we've had, you know, voice actors in games sort of threatening to, to strike, um, you know, because they wanted uh, more more of a share of profits and, and more protection and things like that. And mm. I, or how that ended up shaking out in the end, but you know, it is, it is a situation where most people who work on that game they don't get royalties, even if they're sort of core development team. There might be directors that do, mm. there might be on sales and things like that, but it's not, it's not the same as other industries, and that's probably the model that's going to be taken forward because it's, it's probably you know cheaper when it comes to storytellers because you're not having to give away IP rights. 
I'm interested to hear your take on this, Charlie, because Charlie, I, I, I know, has been through a, kind of a unique scenario in New Zealand um, back in the day, which is that, that actors don't get paid in the same way um, as, as other actors in other parts of the world. So you've, you've kind of been there already with this scenario, haven't you? First hand, yes. No, I was on the board of New Zealand Actors Equity for about eight years. So we took on Peter Jackson and The Hobbit um, because we uh, are the only English speaking country in the world whose performers do not get a royalty. Um, it's a massive problem. Uh, it's hard for me now because I, I'm a creative producer, really. So I sit on the other side and I went many years ago, hey, I'm going to work out their side so I can beat them at their own game. And um, I, I, in terms of my own career, I am the producer as well as the creator. And I, don't, I won't be part of projects unless that's the case because of this issue around the IP and ownership mm -hmm. and that the creatives always get shafted so to speak and i'm trying to break down those barriers work much more collaboratively and just because i might have some money to back a project doesn't mean my job is more important than anyone else's mm. but that's a, that's a way that me and my i guess my generation uh, ha have decided to work we want to break down the hierarchy we, we hate it and um I, uh so that's you know we'll, we'll see how that plays out i'm only at the beginning of my career obviously so but anyway, with The Hobbit, it was, um, it was a tough one. You know, Sir Ian McKellen uh, went and said and talked to all the other actors, said, we will not work on this film unless our Kiwi brothers, who are doing exactly the same job for exactly the same hours and exactly the same amount of prosthetics, are, uh, are paid the same and, most importantly, gain a royalty going forward. Um, a bit different for voice actors, I guess, because it's not their face, but certainly for any actors here, if you're getting your face plastered on a billboard and you've got to go out to a mall and, you know, someone's pointing at you and laughing, damn right you should be remunerated for that happening. So we, we, we took on The Hobbit. Um, it was a, 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 we got absolutely nailed in the media and, and you know, P Mr. Jackson's PR machine of Mordor took us to task, <laughs> but... And saying that we do now have an agreement, it was for the first time that actors, I mean producers, would even kind of take the performing fraternity seriously. You also need to remember, it's such a small industry here, we only have one full-time job for writers, directors and actors, and it's a soap called Shortland Street. So many other countries would have multiple, maybe 20 ongoing full-time productions. We have one. So that can bring into perspective how small it is here, even though we have the might and muscle of Weta and Peter Jackson making these big blockbusters it's very very rare that kiwi performers get senior positions i guess or, or it's kiwi kiwi sorry crew get senior positions they bring in a lot of um overseas uh overseas people and look the reason is especially americans there's three products one's more that's all water there's three bottles of water um what one's the most expensive even though it's all water they will believe that the most expensive one is better um, and, and there was a saying they used to call us Mexicans with cell phones, which was a bit of a, a, a down here in, in New Zealand. But look, we, we've come through a bit of that now. And what I've been teaching and promoting this whole time, trying to circumnavigate or be a disruptor within the old way of this industry, is to, is to own things from the outset and, and, and collaborate with people and writers and, and, be, and, and, and promote equality. That, that's how I work, always have, um, and, I, and I will continue to do so. Okay, so in, in the last word on, on this particular episode of the VR Writers Room, um, I'm going to ask all of you what your stance is then in terms of whether or not you feel that there is a need uh, for significant development in terms of the technology to write for VR, uh, but also where we see this going from a, a technique perspective, um, what new techniques will we need to develop or teach this next generation of writers in order to be able to shift out of these, uh, you know, pre-existing territories that they have been in into VR? I'm going to throw this one at you, Andy. Look, I, 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 I'm, I'm really excited for VR. Mm. Um, in, in terms of writing, um, I think certainly we need to develop and look at um, understanding the sphere and how to write for multiple angles, time frames, frames um, positions, and also the audience. Um, and certainly with other things, I think we, we, there will be a, a legal ramifications that need to be looked at as well. Um, that's as much as I can remember. Sorry. It's a long day. <laughs> 
Do you need me to repeat the question or did you yeah, get go on. did you get most of it? No, I'm, I'm moving on to the next one. You had your chance, Andy. We're oh, on. welcome. <laughs> <laughs> We're moving on. Kevin, did you remember any of the question or do you need me to repeat? Oh, it, it, it's, uh, it is late for me, but luckily my uh, besoddled brain can uh, uh, remember the, uh, the question. It's, to break it down to the key factors for, and again, I wear the hat of the outer home entertainment sector on, which is slightly different from the consumer approach. Mm -hmm. We have dealt with actors, virtual actors, for some time. Um, if you look at something like uh, uh, Turtle Talk, at uh, the Disney parks, there is an actor behind the curtain. You know, there is a wizard uh, behind the curtain that is controlling the virtual character and, uh, you know, lip syncing. So we've had to do the Andy Circus moment. We've had to admit that these people are as uh, valuable as the, uh, uh, the people who um, walk the streets in the Mickey Mouse outfit. Looking towards the future and the trends, we have most of the terminology already laid out. This is not rocket science. This isn't brand new technology. It's been going since easily the 60s, if you look at Sensorama, easily from the uh, 90s, if you look at uh, phase one and phase two and phase three of virtual reality. It's the most important part is learning, sharing, and teaching. And at this moment in time, I am incredibly concerned about the walled gardens that are being constructed by some companies. Mm. And the more those uh, high vine covered walls extend, the less knowledge is shared. And we have one heifer lump, uh, one elephant in the room that could be quite painful for us, and that is sim sickness. If we don't share our knowledge, if we don't pass on and improve our ed editing skills, then we could be looking at that moment that the uh, anime and the animation industry uh, saw in the 80s and the 90s of photosensitive epilepsy slipping in and causing problems. Again, I hate to be the uh, chicken little here in the process, but I think we need to share as much as possible to move forward as much as possible. Indeed. Okay. Charles, what's your take on this? Do you need me to repeat the question? <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, I can wholeheartedly agree with Kevin, and, and it's, it is about sharing and collaborate. It is the age of collaboration. It is also the experience economy right now. People want to pay for memories, and I think in order to fulfill that need, we have to share and collaborate as much as we can. Um, it's not enough just to have one writer. We need a team of writers from all different industries and backgrounds working together collectively for a common goal in order to move this forward. Not dissimilar to the VR writer's room, then. <laughs> that is exactly right. And uh, Rihanna, what's your take on this? I think we've definitely got the talent. Uh, I'm, I'm not worried about the talent because I think the cross, you know, that there, there is a lot of crossover in all in all storytelling, and I think certainly, you know, uh, okay, I, I'm well versed in this sector, but I think the, the game sector is, is kind of going to lead the way in, in terms of journeys and experiences because that's that's already what we're doing. Mm. And, you know, we, I still think we've only scratched the surface in games of, of what the medium is uh, capable of and the stories that we're capable of. And we are, you know, we are pushing further down that, that road. And I think uh, VR will become a, a sort of branch out of that road. So, um the, yeah, the, the, tal the talent is there. I think we're, we're probably going to be drawing uh, as well from writers, directors, cinematographers. We're, we're starting to use them much more in games. I think it really has some interesting potential for performance. Um, obviously, some of the, the big AAA games, you know, we are starting to use mocap to quite a lot. Where you know our actors are doing not only voice but but full. Uh, full body and at times facial mocap as well. You know, we're, we're able to capture perform the fidelity of performance in a way that has never been done before, and I think that's going to, to sort of transfer well into VR. And you know, that might be some kind of licensing issues there as well. Uh, so you know, fun, fun times there. Um, mm -hmm. There's a yeah, there's there's so many stuff that we're already exploring in games. That I think is very transferable. I think you know the the, the expense of the tech. Uh, and and um, you know what was what was being said about the, the kind of sit, the sickness that sometimes inherent with some some people is was also going to be a bit of a barrier, and that's really important in sharing the knowledge of how we can all overcome this if we're going to move it forward. Uh, but you know, as, as 
everyone said it's very exciting times and you know it's my hope that the, the you know the storytellers in the games industry are going to help lead the way mm, absolutely well since Kathleen had to duck out rather early Jeff you get the last word all right well um, I wanted to point out that uh, it was just yesterday um, during a conference between Starlight Runner and our team at uh, United Talent Agency. Uh, these are agents who represent uh, into uh, the video game industry and, and a lot of um, uh, different media platforms. We talked about uh, virtual uh, reality and, and I wanted to get their take on it. Uh, they said that, you know, obviously the, the focus was on, um, uh, you know, whether these companies will be needing um, uh, professionals, creators, writers, and um, uh, we're, we're still early. Um, UTA said that we are two to three years away, they, they felt, from uh, the, the growing industry of virtual reality to be able to uh, draw the kinds of returns necessary to generate uh, the kinds of deeper experiences that would require third-party writers mm. uh, and uh, and and real-world designers to come in and and uh, help to shape that content. So we're we're a little bit um, uh, away from that as of yet, um, but it is promising. They are uh, out there, and um, and things are are happening. Um, we're, we're going to uh, need, once that does happen, we're going to need uh, new methodologies for nonlinear writing. Uh, I'm pretty confident about that. And, um, and what shape that takes is going to be assisted by discussions like the ones uh, we've been having, uh, uh, Tanya, here on the, on the podcast. Um, uh, these discussions, in my experience, are all too rare uh, or right now, and they're absolutely necessary. Uh, we need to talk about the big picture because so many of these groups, so many of these companies are so busy um, uh, just kind of uh, knocking down the, the very next wall uh, of, of, uh, of technological challenges or, or story-related uh, uh, scenarios. Mm. So really uh, appreciative of these kinds of talks. Wonderful. Well, thank you all very much for participating in this VR Writers Room. Uh, as always, we like to give our listeners a way of being able to follow you and find out a little bit more about you. So uh, if you would like to share with us your social media handle of choice, I'm going to start with you, Andy. What's the question again? No, I'm only <laughs> um, uh, It's uh, Twitter, please. And it's Andy, A-N-D-I, Ewington, E-W-I-N-G-T-O-N. Wonderful, thank you. And since Kathleen is absent, I shall share with you a uh, social media handle of choice, which I know is Twitter, and that is at Kathleen Wallace. And uh, Jeff, why don't you tell us your social media handle of choice? Um, on Facebook, it's uh, Jeff Gomez, and on Twitter, it's at Jeff underscore Gomez. That's at Jeff underscore Gomez. And don't forget the underscore. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and uh, Kevin, why don't you share with us your social media handle of choice? I'm old school. Uh, I appreciate people to go through the website, uh, www.dna-association.com, uh, and uh, any questions or if they want to join uh, our news networks, just ask them. Wonderful. Thank you. And uh, Rihanna? Uh, mine is Twitter, and it's at the Pratchett. That's at R H I P R A T C H E W T, or you can get hold of me via uh, the, the contact page of my very out of date website. And by the way, you do have one of the coolest little avatars on Twitter. <laughs> oh, that, that, that is actually me, uh, uh, as appears in a little game called Super Glyph Quest, which <laughs> I really recommend because I'm the baddie in it. Oh, awesome. So that's a tip everybody should have. Um, Charlie? What's your social media handle of choice? Uh, you can find me on Facebook, Charlie McDermott, M C D E R M O W T, Auckland, New Zealand. Wonderful. Well, thank you once again for joining us on this VR Writers Room special. And uh, thank you for listening. If you think this content is interesting and you would like to hear more, then don't forget to subscribe and review. And visit the website to listen to the other VR Writers Room sessions. 
Thank you for joining us. DigitalJamSessions.com